But yeah, that gets me into the right mindset. I don't know about you, Nicole. But oh, you're 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 muted. You're muted. Let me get you. Boom. You got you got to hit the. There you go. Oh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to have weird background noises as the intro was happening. Because I've heard that before and it's very awkward. Especially if someone's yelling at their kids or like, get a bed, I'm doing an interview. You're like, oopsie. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> um, well, well it, it, uh, the program actually uh, mutes it. Well, it does like videos and then, uh, and then when it pops up. So, so like people don't have to like focus on it. Mm. But if you, if you hit it manually, then. Uh, Got it. That it does the thing. The more uh, you know. <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> the more you know, because I just made it awkward. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for the rainbow. The yeah. rainbow. Um. No. No. Uh. I'm glad you came on, and I'm glad we uh before we uh started the show up, we we uh we wanted to talk about um. And correct me if I'm wrong. Uh. The 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 statement. Uh. You have to read to be a great writer. Is that, is that is that correct? That's what we're going to discuss today. The statement you have to read to be a great writer. Um, yeah, and you know whatever uh, random questions stem from that, because I'm sure you, we can go in so many different ways. But yeah, oh. main thing, and then branch off. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll flicker and flacker all yeah. over the place. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the two of us. Yes, we will. That's right. We might not even talk about it, you know, it'll just go yeah. into talk about Mars for some reason or, yeah. or uh, you know, Athea, you know, uh, the planet, the planet that turned into the moons. But um, so uh, let me I guess I'll start the audience off to understand. So the statement you you must read to be a great writer or you must be a prolific reader, prolific reader to be a great writer. My position on that is just the caveat that it's so final is a finality to it. Meaning if you don't read, you can't be a great writer. And I, I believe reading is helpful. Just like, again, I'm a musician. I learned how to play guitar. Listening to songs helped me understand what I had learned. But if I never listened to music, I still was learning music. Um, but I don't think listening to music made me a great guitarist. Uh, so that's why I believe the statement as a black and white, if you do, if you don't read, you can't be a great writer. Nicole, what are your thoughts on that statement, that stance? Yeah, I would say the same as you. Uh, I know a lot of people that don't read like as much as I do. I think I'm at 150 books. Just this year, right? Yeah, just <laughs> just this year maybe they'll read like one or two a month and that's good you know that's good for them they maybe they do already uh audiobooks like all the time but they're not reading yeah. you know that that works as well maybe they're just reading comics and graphic novels it counts i think also it there's the whole thing of uh xyz doesn't count as reading oh, yeah. <laughs> taking in stories it's it's it counts. Yeah, because um, even watching television or film, like you're, if you're watching the flow of narrative, you might not be understanding, you know, what a pro is or, or like, you know, a tag or anything, but you're still yeah. seeing like pace. You're getting to understand pace. You're getting to understand character, nuance, you know. Um, you know, do you agree with that? Yeah, though I did not grow up in a great educational system mm -hmm. so i was not taught what's an adverb what's a noun <laughs> what's an adjective i i learned that in high school and it still does not stick with me i have to sometimes look it up yeah because it was supposed to be taught in elementary school it was taught to me in high school i think like junior year like it was it's not it was not a good look okay yeah, so I have gaps, and I, I finally got used to grammar and punctuation in high school, and then I went into community college, and I had to do, like, I don't know what it's called, like, not even 101, it, it was under 101, oh, oh, which yeah, was yeah. really annoying to me, because <laughs> <laughs> writer. Yeah. Really? We're going to do this? Okay, great. But it was because I did not know 
the rules of punctuation and grammar and I just blew, flunked that uh, test that you do, or at least I did, to see where you were in, at community college, as well yeah. as like my GPA was like 3.3k. That's amazing, considering not great education system. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was chugging along. <laughs> but well, all I, great writers have great <laughs> editors. So, you know. Yeah. No, so then I get into the lower level of uh, the, that English class and I write, you know, the essays and stuff. And the professor was like, you're a great writer. You just don't know the rules and you, <laughs> you can fix that. That's not a problem. I'll help you. And yeah. so now I know, and then I actually write really clean and my editor do, is not really fixing th that type of problem. But yeah, like you said, an editor is great. Also, I learned at least enough from just reading that I unconsciously do a lot of things and I at least knew how to set up dialogue and the tags yep. and the flow of like how big a paragraph should be versus maybe this one line just needs to be a line and then then the paragraph afterwards can be a little longer and like it's like a flow and what do you want to punctuate i was yeah. doing a little too much uh with the commas well yeah also like you're you too know, much with those. <laughs> well yeah like if you're writing yeah. like an, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you're writing an essay they usually say you know a paragraph is true to form at four to five mm -hmm. sentences right but like with with a with a with writing a novel one word could be a paragraph and yeah. it, it, you know, it comes down to really, you know, how you move the breathing, you know, that bump, 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 and like, you know, a word, several words, or even one pro having uh, several different lengths of, uh, of sentences within it. And again, that, that probably comes to somebody who reads, of course, because they're seeing the familiarity of it. They're seeing it yeah. in motion, you know, um, but, you know, an argument I, I always throw out there is like, when I was learning guitar, my teacher always said the same thing over and over. If you're if you're practicing the mistakes, you're learning nothing. So you have to stop when you're off the beat and you have to stop when you mess up the notes and start over. So if again, if I was just reading, I'm only learning the mistakes of what my mind believes are the things I should be learning. Just as if I only if I only learned how to write, I might not necessarily be learning how to write just by, you know, like, so there has to be a nice mixture of, of taking in story as well as learning the process. Not, not necessarily like, I don't think musicians need to learn theory, even though like I went deep into it cause I was in jazz class when I started, but, but I don't think writers, like, as you're saying, you know, like you have to learn the, the super depth of it. No, like you have an understanding of story. So that like that's a great foundation to play with, you know. Uh, but like reading allows you to take that foundation and ultimately go, all right, I see it in practice, right? But that's my argument. Also, is like you could do that by watching a movie. You could do it by hearing a story told. You know, like there are other ways, or even audiobooks. Like I don't think you need to read if you're listening to audiobooks because you're hearing, you're hearing writing in practice. And I think that's important to absorb life as well. So if you're absorbing life through the audiobooks, if you're reading, whatever your method is, I think that's important. But like when someone's like, oh, you don't read? Oh, well, then how can you be a great writer? Like I feel like what are you doing to other writers that have trouble reading consistently? Like you're yeah. basically telling them to give up. And like I think that, that doesn't uh, – um, and you know me. I Like in the community, like I'm all about like – just write, even if it's crap, start yeah. somewhere, <laughs> you know, like don't deter people. Be, oh, you, oh, you don't, you didn't read 50 books this month. You're not, you're never going to understand writing. <laughs> there. Well, also, uh, what do you mean by great? <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. Do people yeah. like it? It's good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, like do the majority of people like it? Yeah. Um, and then also, if not, then mm, 
two ways you go about it. You, or I think actually multiple ways, you put too much in there. Like when you have like a, like a five genre book that's like 900 pages, I don't know about that. <laughs> okay. Um, or um, maybe you do need a lot of work, but it, you can do it if you want to, or like you marketed it to the wrong people, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's different types of, if it's not working out for you, there are options that you can explore at least. And, um, but I also think that you have to pay attention and that's what's something that I'm seeing where people are listening to audiobooks but they're not paying attention so you can listen to audiobooks all day long or watch a movie but if you're not paying attention then then that's like background noise yeah, and so you're 100%. not soaking in the story or the beats or even the visuals if it's a, a film so then mm, are you learning that much i would say possibly not even if you have ADD or ADHD, I still have to pay attention to things to have them stick in my brain. I can like do multiple things, but if it needs to truly stick in there and stay for a long time instead of a short memory type of thing, <laughs> then yeah. I'm going to pay attention. Um, there, I just listened to the color of outer space by hp lovecraft i can't read on a screen and it was a pdf <laughs> um, i was just like no i can't I, it was and the writing was like oh my god i don't i can't do this <laughs> so it was like an hour and a half uh audio on like a, a horror um youtube channel that reads either submissions or like really old stuff. So you're not oh, going to get cool. it. Right? Yeah. And it was very pretty. I don't know if I could have read that. That prose is. Like it was purpley. It was very purpley. Oh yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the man's voice. Fantastic. I got yeah. the vibe. I got the cosmic horror. It doesn't scare me. Cosmic horror is not creepy to me. It was just, it was an interesting ride. Did he and, sound like Vincent Price? <laughs> no. Like a deeper, like a gravelly oh, voice. Yes. More like this. Yeah. Not <laughs> not as a uh, hissy. No, <laughs> the, yeah. the sun well, was shining in the space. <laughs> yeah. But I think it worked. Um, and there's, I think for me, there are things that I uh, couldn't read. Like, I don't know if I could read a HP Lovecraft. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ooh, dense. Yeah. It's yeah. very dense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um I don't think I can figure out what's going on. And I think that depends on the person. And then like what are you learning from that? Or do you want to just be entertainment? And then also another point would be I would argue that if you're going to write in a genre, you should be reading that genre as oh, much yeah. as you can. Or, or or studying that genre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, doing something to be like, well, what is this? Because imagine writing romance and you, you're like, they don't they don't stay together at the end. Well, then you don't understand the core fundamentals yeah. of romance. <laughs> you know. Um, and if you don't like that, there has to be a happily ever after. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere, yeah. Um, if I if I may go back to uh, you said something earlier. You said uh, you know what is great and. Um, I would I this is my position on that and and I would love to hear your thoughts on it. I believe there is objectively good and bad writing based on uh based on the technique or the process of writing. However, however, I also believe that even great writing could not connect to people. Meaning like if that's where preference comes in. Mm -hmm. So like I know a lot of people that love Stephen King and obviously he is a great writer. He's prolific. Yeah. He's been writing forever. I can't get into it, but me not liking it doesn't make it bad writing. Yeah. But so I, I do that with music too. Like I could listen to music and be like, I'm not into this, but I, I know it's good music. I like, I know it's good writing. 
So I, I believe there's objectively good and bad writing based on the foundation of structure and the, but that doesn't, great writing doesn't make it good. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like the experience for someone is always going to be subjective. Yeah. No, yeah. No, you know, cause there are people that say Tolkien is boring and bad and you can't say they're wrong because that's their subjective truth. Yeah. You know, but you and I read it and we go, this is objectively good. It probably wouldn't be published today as it was. Like if he was a writer today, they would be like, clean it up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But he defined the genre, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what are your thoughts on that idea where there is objectively good and bad writing based on the foundation and process of writing? However something that would be considered great writing doesn't make it necessarily good. Yeah. I'll have to say that I haven't, I don't read a lot of self-published books and I know there are probably some that have like no edits. Right. But then like you don't really see them get popular. Maybe yeah. they'll have like one or two reviews but it's it's kind of like they're like the book cover is not there you read the sample and it's like whoa yep. and then you see like not necessarily the title but maybe the title is like this is supposed to be fantasy but it sounds christian <laughs> romance what are we crap <laughs> yeah. <New> christianity <laughs> yeah and then like the the categories are weird but that's more like I don't know what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Could it be that like, if everything got it together, like it could be good. Maybe I have no idea, but I'm, I'm personally not going to buy or take a chance on something where like the, in the read sample, which is about, I think maybe they changed it, but it was yeah. at least the first chapter, if not, two or three, depending how long the chapters are, right? But let's say 10%. If there are so many typos and formatting issues, eh, I'm going to skip it. But then I have seen some bad writing when I was on Wattpad, but they were like 15 years old. Yeah. They're, I can't say. It's I expected. haven't. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can't say bad writing that I've read other than the two that I've mentioned. So there could, I'm, sh I'm sure there's bad writing. I know there is because of those yeah. two points, but I don't think it's big enough that it's a huge problem. Then again, that is mm, like an opinion because I know a lot of people will, you know, that goes with your preference thing, right? That a lot yeah. of people think that, um yeah like stephen king's writing is too much and it's too long and he could cut it in half and it's still a story blah 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 right yeah um and i see and i do agree with the the sarah j mass where her writing not the greatest as in she uses mate and male fay so much <laughs> right but they have wings so much right? <laughs> um but the story and the character arcs for me make up for the not so great writing therefore it's either four or five star books the third book in the trilogy well it's not really a trilogy anymore what is it a court of i'm trying to cheat a court <laughs> of wins and ru ruin that's like three and a half stars i didn't like this arc the story arc that's why it was three instead of the four and five that i got gave to the other um novels in that book series and i would say if you make me cry it has to be at least a four stars so i have to punch you when you're reading my book to get a four star <laughs> i'm i wouldn't cry i would punch you in the throat now. oh son of a bitch <laughs> Should I get a five star if I fight back? <laughs> yeah, possibly. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna have to see how that goes. Gonna but um, I think that 
if you can bring up a motion, it doesn't particularly matter if the writing is not up to par to what I love. Yeah. Like, for example, Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsar. Kingsar. I'm already in. <laughs> great book. Great writing. Great storytelling. That's a that's a perfect for me. Now, I've seen other people are like, ooh, it's a, a redneck uh, David <laughs> Copperfield. This is stupid, and I'm like, it's 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 more than that. But okay, I respect your opinion. <laughs> so, and I'm like, is he really a redneck when he's like tri-racial? And I don't, I don't. Okay, Whew. okay, I'm gonna calm down. And okay, <laughs> I saw that uh, quite a few times on Goodreads, and I'm funny. at a. That's objective. They thought it was not good. Yep. But I think it's fantastic of all the things. So, yeah, I can see that uh, structure that you pointed out. Definitely mm -hmm. agree with it. Um, I I can't think, even like the, the one or two star books that I've read, it's not the writing and yeah it's like the choices made of storytelling and well the thing with classics i can't really do it with the classics because there's the, a style yeah it's, it's so blocky <laughs> and where are the periods and why why is this paragraph on two pages where's the break I need a break. That was Dracula. That was Dracula. Oh my god. Oh, oh. well, that's because, that's also written in a very unfamiliar format, like because it's an inter yeah. it's a diary. So, um, well, then they also he also included um, dialogue within the diary. Yeah, and I'm like, you have a fantastic memory. <laughs> yeah, he's like, oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, no, I I I, I agree what you're saying, and it's like, um. But you know, like if you've ever watched the the, the movie The Room, right, with uh, Tom, uh, whatever, uh, Wojciech or whatever, like it's it's just it's objectively a bad movie. Like everything that makes a movie great is not there. But subjectively, it has connected with the world. Like people love this movie. It's they they go to the theater when it shows again because they do showings and they like they mm -hmm. interact with it. It's like watching Rocky Horror Picture Show. You know that's that's subjectively great experience. Sort of like what you're saying. Like if it moves me emotionally, I'm in. Right. Like, yeah. and I've read books where, and I and I'm a, uh, I'm I'm you know I I did script I script doctoring work in, in the uh, entertainment, but I'm also mm -hmm. uh you know I I'm basically a developmental editor. So like. I have a fluid understanding of all the terms and the, and the process and, and how to dissect a story, et cetera, et cetera. But I have read books where I read it and I'm just like, they have, they don't, they don't know what they're doing, but I love the book. Like I would be like, I'm really enjoying this. Um, yeah. But even going back to the nineties or, or the early two thousands, but the nineties, there's a book um, called Lord Soth, right? It's during the Dragonlance uh, you know, it's part of that whole thing. And it's Dungeon and Dragons books, you know, oh. like Margaret Weiss and all them. But this isn't written by Margaret Weiss. But you read Lord Soth and you're it, it's such a fun book. But it's no masterpiece <laughs> by yeah. any means, you know, and, and I think that that's kind of where my stance, like why my stance is, you know, a great book doesn't make it good. Because it really that that subjective experience, like you're saying, like you could be reading a great book, but if it doesn't move you emotionally and you're not connecting to it, you're not going to like the book. Right. That's like what you say, like you there has to be something more than it's just perfect writing, like perfect writing doesn't make a good experience. You know, you could have all your periods where you need them, all your commas, you're doing a prose right, you're using pacing correctly. But for some reason, I'm not connecting to the Fae. The Fae are boring me. I'm not. I, they yeah. have wings. Like, they're flying around. There's magic fingers. Why is David Copperfield here? Like, 
<laughs> like, you know, you're just not, uh, this is not the book for me. But when it comes down to technique or craftsmanship, uh, it's perfect. And and I guess that's my argument, like just with the community and, and professionals and the, just the public, it's just like great writing doesn't make it good. Reading doesn't make you a great writer. Like there's so much involved, you know, life experience, like you you said you didn't grow up in, in a good educational system, but you have such, you know, obviously I don't want to get into your past or anything, but just by knowing you, you have a prolific or a strong and, and, and I would say dense uh, uh, past that has allowed you to write characters with depth because you understand the emotion you're working through. And that I don't think has much to do with craftsmanship. That has to do with understanding the choices you make for the characters. And that's a whole, that you can, it's like comedy. You can learn to write a joke, but you can't learn to be funny. Funny yeah. is something you need to understand and that's through experience, right? But if you watch comics, that's not gonna make you a great comic. If you're just, oh, let me study their joke. Like you still need like no Robin Williams is Robin Williams because he's Robin Williams. Not you know, me. Louis Louis C.K. is Louis C.K. because he's you know, like his life experiences gave him that insight. Mm -hmm. And I feel the same way with you as a writer, because I've read your stuff, right? Uh the um the Oh wait, you have? <laughs> Yeah. That's new to me. <laughs> well, I know you're a uh, self-published author, but I support my friends. Uh, oh, yeah, thank you. I, I hope you read my book when it comes out. All right. Um, just uh, my, I feel my like book your, is yours is epic fantasy. It's going to take a long time. But Almost. Uh, yeah, email email me when it comes out <laughs> in like yeah. 10 years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, uh, the way... The way I write, because I I come from television and film, mm -hmm. I uh I outline. That's the longest part. Is like uh, I yeah. put a lot of time in outlining because you know I, I deal with people that need to see it so they can be like changes, add that, change the pace of this. So I just became very attuned to that. Like I really I didn't start out that way. I was like I'm a pantser and I'm just gonna write. <laughs> and uh, someone was like, well, I need to see the plot just so I understand the beats are there. And I was like, all right. Right. And I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. Uh, but that's my <laughs> style. I don't think everyone needs to do it. Um, yeah. So I spend a lot of detail and I'm sure if you've ever watched any of my outlining videos that I did live, like I'm very detailed, but then writing is like that because the prose and imagery and immersion, like that part is easy to me. If I don't have to think like, if I don't have to sit there and go, why are they doing that? Cause it's already mm -hmm. there in the, in the, in the outline for me. Cause I do such deep outlining where I'm just like, well, I know what needs to happen, why it needs to happen. I know who these characters are. I know their voices. So now I could just play with words. And, um, I do about, uh, I do 3000 words a day when I'm writing and I do 21,000 words a week. Mm. And that's in an hour and a half to two hours of time because I just, I give myself focus time when I'm in the writing not the outlining. Outlining is a lot slower, but once I'm writing, I'm very, very fast and I'm very, very clean because I'm not I don't have to think about the skeleton because mm -hmm. I just look at the plot point and I go, I got to write to that moment. I'm in the moment. All right. Now I got to write out of the moment. Now I got to write to the next moment. So it's like, you know, it's a. Uh, uh, um, but yeah, it might still take 10 years. But it's, just still it's epic. It's epic. Well, it's 12 yeah. books. So, but oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. The first book's almost <laughs> there, though. Well, I'm doing the bare bones writing method now. The bare I'm bones. Doing, yeah, I'm doing the skeleton. What is needed is yes. the skeleton. And then for the first draft, and then I add on, you know, the meat, which is totally metal. But <laughs> 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 uh, because I was not, I was stuck in the middle with Murderous Fairies, and which is the second book in the Midnight Detective Agency. And mm -hmm. I forget who uh, told me it. Shout out to you, stranger. I don't remember <laughs> who that was. And it was probably in passing on like a live stream or something. 
because I, I was talking about it to a few people and they said, do the bare bones writing method where you just write the skeleton. You don't look at word count at all. And you don't look at how many chapters there are. Just add what you need. And I was like, okay. Interesting. I like it. And I thought about it. And so then I did it. And then I finished the first draft of Murderous Fairies in like two months when I was struggling since like January. January to, when did I finish it? I think like a month ago, month and a half. Yeah long process it turned out to be forty six thousand words it is what it is well yeah that's, um, that's your first draft like that's like your zero draft ultimately where you're just kind of discovering the story because you don't outline you you pants right well i have to outline the mystery and i know the beginning so like for the third book now i know uh that tessa's parents visited and she's going to come back uh, from dropping them off to the airport and she's going to go to the coffee coffee shop and hang out. And then she's going to come back and there's going to be a naked shape shifter in her house that she has to hide because the, uh, the shape shifter is a rare shape shifter where they can turn into humans. Okay. So you can see the problems that might arise. So the, <laughs> Queen and King of the Fae have given this shapeshifter uh, a house in like the middle of nowhere with bodyguards, but all her bodyguards are murdered and she's about, she's nearly kidnapped. And yeah. that's how I had, and I was like, so who's kidnapping her? I don't know. <laughs> but I'm like, no, I need to know this time because we're not doing what, we, what I've been doing because the mystery is important. So I do, I, I do actually know who they are and why and yay i've figured out the whole thing now i don't outline like you do i just know I, I write it down in a notebook like i know the beginning and then i can see the scene in my head playing mm -hmm. out as a movie and then i'm toying with is that house and the plot of land in the other world with all the other beings or is it in this world so then she can go to the plot of land and look at the dead bodies and all that stuff um and that's your urban mysteries you're talking about right like with the redhead yeah whatever. yeah urban fantasy mysteries yeah, yeah, yeah. and so that might that <clears throat> section might be pants like i don't know if tessa well not really tessa i don't know if the shapeshifter is going to be in the other world or not, but Tessa can't go into the other world because she's human. So we're going to have like that thing going on because in murderous fairies, it's in Santa Fe and there were uh, 12 dead fairies that ended up on a man's front lawn. And so she saw all the dead fairies with the blood and the guts and all that stuff. <laughs> that's it. Do that again. Like she's a little traumatized. She threw up a few times. It's like, <laughs> It's her third in Midnight Murders. It's her third ever case. Like, do we want to keep torturing her with the dead body? <laughs> you know, you know, uh, <laughs> she's getting used to it, but like, okay. So there are just some like small things where it's going to be pants, but it's the flow of the story. Mm -hmm. But I know the bare bones and I am technically outlining. It's just not, um, that in depth i'm i have saved the cat which i'm going to read for nonfiction november yeah and i'm gonna see if that helps i don't well, know that's specifically the hero's journey though that that's more oh, focused yeah yeah so i mean it, it's a good read just for yeah. like the fundamentals of it but it is it is a it's more a hero's journey um yeah. And also it talks about a really like the famous thing in in the book is the save the cat thing, which is every character has to have a save the cat moment where the audiences have yeah. empathy and connect yeah. with them. And it go, mm -hmm. kind of goes into that. But um, 
real quick, what's the, what's I can't remember the the book I read from. It was uh, it's the one with the uh, minister Martin Blackmore's thick Bible landed dead center on his rickety pulpit with a boom. Oh, the that two one? Foxes. Oh, that's it. Yeah, the two foxes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you read that one? That was an uh, interesting choice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just, I don't, I don't judge covers. I don't judge anything. I just go, my friend wrote this. Let me see what I got here. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, that's what I was looking for. I was like, what? Because I was like trying yeah. to remember the line and everything. Um, so, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when you outline, it sounds like you, you, uh, you beat outline. So you basically go, this has happened. This has happened. Introduce this. Uh, you know, this character has to do something here but you're not going into dialogue. You're not going into potential mood or tone with prose. You're just kind of like bullet pointing out the beats, right? Is that, is that, would that be accurate? Yeah, I guess because, um, <clears throat> well, they're very basic. I didn't know about beat outlining. I just have to do it for the urban fantasy because it's a mystery. And if you mess up the mystery, <laughs> <laughs> what's the point of what you're doing um that's not good that's that's what it is it's not good I'm <laughs> i could i really i well no i t the last conversation where we had it was on my channel i was talking and you were like no but you that's outlining yeah i'm like oh <laughs> Oh, so I'm not like a total mm. panther? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, I do that one. See, like, there's the stuff that I don't know. I just write. Yeah. That was then, the thing for my standalones. I just wrote. But I forget who it was. Maybe it was Chris Fox in one of his books or his one of his talks. If not, sorry to whoever said this. But <laughs> it was Bad. it was who, like, if you read enough in, a, in your specific genre, like a hundred plus books, which I've done. Yeah. You unconsciously understand the basics, at mm -hmm. least the basics, if not more. And so that was probably what was happening with those standalones. Cause I did not even do the bare bones method. That's brand new as of, you know, 2023, like mid 2023. Yeah. <laughs> and um, though I think it was a bit easier because there was time like historical timelines i don't like changing dates and events and all that stuff yeah. so i just followed the timeline of historical events yeah so it's kind of form, yeah. like kind of sort of like outlining but not really and then i just wrote not really around it i wrote on it and then you know on the sides is where i make stuff up yeah that would make the fictional of historical and and also the writer aspect is putting it together you know and i might even say that uh you're an outlier when it comes to your because you are you you clearly have a craft uh understanding of the craft in your books um but like to be where you're at uh based on reading i think that makes you an outlier like um, but that's not a bad thing also, you know, and, and that, that goes back to the whole reason we started the conversation, which is for someone to assume that, well, if, if you must read to become a great writer, you know, but even still you're saying right now, you're learning new techniques, new terminology, new methods. And would you agree learning that stuff and, and, and trying it is helping you hone and improve as a writer beyond just, I learned how to write the book from reading. Yeah, it's actually, it's made my book shorter. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, <laughs> but and a Patriot's tale is like 89,000 words. I don't know if you read that one, but like, some... but yeah, that, that's a good size. That's a good size. Yeah. That's what and, 27 um, chapters. No, it's like 47. I write, oh, oh. I write short chapters. Yeah, you, yeah, you write short chapters, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Danu's Curse is 68,000. Okay. That's and like a novella. Book, yeah. No, novella is under 40,000 words. Is it? Yeah. I'm Even with the urban fantasy, they're, uh, they're novels. But then uh, to 
round up. Daniel's Curse is like 67,000 words. Okay. But you also have like the, the historical stuff and like a boop, boop, sprinkle in there, right? <laughs> but for uh, the urban fantasy, Obsidian Murders is 47,000 words. Okay, okay. Murders Fairies is 46. Who knows about the other ones? But like they're all under 50,000 words. And mm -hmm. at first I was like, I need to add more words. <laughs> a little bit, right? If it's not 50,000 or more. And I had to be told a number of times by uh, a few of the, um, they call them the ad squad, but I'm part of Brian Cohen's ad school and they're fantastic. Um, and a lot of the ad squad members who are like prolific writers in their genre also do um, also work with Brian Cohen. They're like, if it's a complete story, Nicole, do not fill it in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't just add random stuff to get to the perfect 50,000. Ask people, ask friends, family members, strangers, whatever. How much do you think this is this random book? How many words do you think it is? They're not going to get it. Yeah. They're not going to know how many words because you're self publishing yeah. also. So yeah. And, um, and that's also what like a lot of the problems with it doesn't matter. Self publishing hybrid trad publishing, where I will say this book, you could have cut out 30 pages because it's filler because you yeah. wanted it to be there. So I think that with learning more of the craft, and I haven't even read that many craft books, but I think honing in on what I need and want to say and portray has made it shorter. Yeah. And I have also gotten um, it like, I don't know, I think simple is fine. Yeah. I like simple. But some people are like, that's not a good thing, Nicole. I'm like, I think it's good. I'm I need more immersion. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm like, so do you want purple prose? Do you want flowery yeah. language? I don't like that. So I write simply. Simply as in like the paragraphs are not two pages long. <laughs> okay. Or you're not like, Anne Rice? <laughs> yeah. Okay. A DNF queen of the damned. I couldn't do it. I can't do, I can't read it. I can't write it. That's not for me, but you know, I, I, bow which is down subjective, right? Yeah. I bow down to Anne Rice. Fantastic. I just can't read that. Yeah. She, she's again, that's another dense. Yes. Like, yes. should take eight pages from the walk through a door, you know, <laughs> Yeah, I can't do that. Um, so I, I guess it would be dense versus simple. I would be on the simple yeah. spectrum. I don't see that as a problem. Um, I like to get to the point. <laughs> don't uh, take eight pages to walk through the door. <laughs> like uh, I have things to do. Tick tock. Yeah, like, exactly. We all have things to do. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Well, I, you know, I'll tell clients like when they like you're reading like deep purple prose or like they're just go, and they think that's immersion. And you go, the strongest immersion you can create is when what you write moves the narrative forward. Mm -hmm. And that could be moved either with plot, character or world building. If you're just describing something because you want to describe it, that's where you're adding fluff because it doesn't serve any purpose it's like if someone's going to sit in a chair now you can talk about that chair but you don't have to talk about the crack in the corner of the room uh you know that leads up to the the ceiling unless narratively that's a character choice that they're noticing the destruction of that, right and that'll definitely slim down uh yeah. anybody's book especially you know like um one thing i get from uh, a lot of people who read my stuff is they say uh, a it's cinematic and B there's no fluff because uh, I just follow two rules. The first one is uh, every sentence, every sentence has to have either uh, plot character or world building or any variation of those three together. And the second rule is that every sentence needs to go into the other sentence 
and uh, making it so it's not a statement. You know, like uh, like if you read a, a a pro and it goes, they sat on the couch, they looked over to the window, they noticed their friend enter. Like those are statements. Mm-hmm. And technically to fix that, you either make them flow into each other or you make it its own pro and you give some time to it, you know? Uh, it, and um, that helps me keep a stream, even though I'm writing epic fantasy, <laughs> there's still a streamline to it where I don't, I don't spend 20 days on someone's armor, you know, like the inlays of the armor. Was, and then eight pages later, you're like, is there anyone else in the scene? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I tried, uh, uh, Game oh, of Thrones. Oh, yeah. yeah. No. That's no. <laughs> Did you I think read the first that... book, Game of Thrones? Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> no, it's because it's just too much. Also, I don't like the different point of views. When you get past oh, two, okay. I'm like, why? Why is this a choice? Um, I understand for that, but like, how many POV chapters are there? Like, yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, that is a preference because. Obviously, so many people of Game of Thrones. I preferred kind of the show until like the last season. Mm-hmm, okay. mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure everyone. Uh, I actually haven't seen someone that was that said the last season was great. <laughs> so I think that we're all on agreement with there, right? So I, so it does happen sometimes where it's like. That was a choice. <laughs> yes. They didn't even make that choice. Well, the head writers left, so they had no other choice other than uh, going, I know what to do. <laughs> we'll make Daenerys evil. Yeah, <laughs> she has the kingdom, but she's like the hell with it. They wait, they 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 gave up? They they surrendered? Burn it all. Yeah. No, you know what? Yeah. You know? no. There are some, like there are some choices where it's like why, and then you just forget about that last season or that last book or second to last book, and then just skip to the you know actual last book. Which I've heard um, for this one urban fantasy traditionally published really long series where people are like yeah okay read the first book and then skip the second and third but then you can go to the fourth one and the fifth one then go back to the uh the third and yeah. then you read the second i'm like no, I'm that. Right. no. <laughs> how about they all work and if not then something needs to be done something should have been done because this yeah. is like a 20 book series and it keeps going i'm like does it need to keep going if like a lot of people are saying skip this, skip this, okay, go back, then then it would make sense, and then this doesn't make sense, so go like to book nine. <laughs> I don't know. So you there are read book things. seventeen before you read book one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? What? It's uh, an interesting concept. I don't know if that's prevalent. I, that's the only time people, multiple people, not just one, multiple people have said, okay, do this. And then you'll like it. Like, I don't think so. <laughs> like, I'm not going to do any of that. Um, well, your urban books, do you write them uh, primarily in first person? Yes. They're first person and the standalones are third. Yeah, yeah third um, limited. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I have a female gladiator historical fiction in mind. And I think that's going to be in first person because the – when I had that idea anyway, it was an I. Yeah. So I'm like, well, I'm not going to change it to make it, you know, third person. If the idea, the dream was in first person. You're not going to make it second person? No, it's just the main person. <laughs> you the- enter the room as you stare around. Have you ever read books like that? It's crazy. I don't like second person. It yeah, makes me dizzy. <laughs> Uh, um, I, I actually want to ask you a question, though, about uh, uh-huh. POVs. Uh, when you write third person limited, do you still allow yourself to uh, partake in uh, other characters that are there? Since you are in that third person view, you're 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 out, but you're close to everybody, you know, 
do you allow yourself to uh not necessarily head hop because that head hopping just yeah. for anyone that doesn't know the term it's when you're jumping POVs of characters within a passage. However, you can jump from one character to another if you create a transition, a soft mm-hmm. chapter break, a hard chapter break, a chapter, or in prose, as long as the prose lead to the transition. Uh, but anyway, do you find yourself in third person limited giving some time to other characters within the chapter? Uh, no, it's just through the main character but she it's all through the main character so you do see um like emotion in their face or the tone and i'll point that out and then it would be like um let's say for example sarah and red fox she's seen what he um his like his body language and so i'll describe that through her but it's not first person so there's a little bit more explanation and it's not like telling i'm showing the thing that i actually didn't know was that i was doing third person limited i was just writing (laughs) (laughs) oh my yeah that's i'm an outlier i mean you should i don't know um if it works for you like if you're similar to me, go for it, but also do a little craft. <laughs> because, yeah, yeah. Still got to do uh, a little craft, make a little noise, get down yeah. tonight. <laughs> because you're, I have had a lot of people like, okay, so like, what is like, you know, going into, you know, this particular chapter? Uh, how did you do this, this, and that? I'm like, I just wrote. <laughs> I just, my I magic wrote. fingers. <laughs> yeah. I had some wine. Um, <laughs> like if you saw the first draft of that, Mm. (laughs) the first draft doesn't matter i didn't publish it because you think that this uh, chapter is great however wow Uh, (laughs) don perrion helped me write this chapter (laughs) that was danny's curse uh for the whole of covid but it was because it was covid i wrote that in six months what else am i supposed to do right um but for uh actually for the urban fantasy it was originally third person. And then I was doing market research, which yeah, I'm sure everyone's person. like, <laughs> market research. Um, Cause I've got, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was uh, looking in the top 50, top 100 of urban fantasy in the read, the read sample. And they yeah. were all first person. Correct. Yeah, I was cause, like, mm. cause it's also a oh. mystery. So, Yes. The rule is if it's noir or something of the si- of the like, it has to be first person because then the reader is discovering the mystery with the character. Yes. And third person just it takes you out of it a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then, so then I uh, went to the ad school, ad school, and I was like, dilemma. And they were like, <laughs> okay, so do you want to have an uphill battle? They were like, it is your choice, right? Yep. But it is an uphill battle. If you publish it and you have a six book series, it's not like it's a standalone. It's a six book series. Mm-hmm. You're, you've done all this stuff, you, like fantastic covers. You've got the title and the subtitle and you nailed the, the categories and summary is great, but it's in third person. And you s- said yourself every single read sample is in first person yeah uphill battle because that's what the readers are expecting and so i was still a little slightly itchy but i was like i have an uphill battle with basically everything under my given name (laughs) (laughs) um It's an uphill battle for all of those, it's like especially the poetry. Like, yeah, yeah, I don't do Instagram poetry, so they get reads when they do, which is like whenever, <laughs> right? But the like, if you want to do marketing, yeah. and if you um, want to have like a wider audience and not go so niche like I do with Nicole Pierman. <laughs> the Pierman. Um, <laughs> uh, you should consider first person. I'm like, okay. 
I kept the third person. I haven't even opened that document. I changed it, you know, I changed it all to first person. I'm like, damn, I know why it's in in first person. It's way more fun. Yep. So it's not like market research. You should be like, you know, freaking out and gagging and having a panic attack because like you're selling out or whatever. There are points. Yeah. That makes sense. Absolutely. You're having a fan. I was having a fantastic time being, being Tessa and first person hanging out with a fatherly ghost named George in her apartment. That guy still owes me money. Yes. He's really (laughs) old. You know, maybe you'll, you get to talk to him sometime or, you know, the, you know, discovering that there is a vampiric detective that wears sunscreen and um, then he can walk out into the sun, but you know he's just he has what is that the um, the white that really really um, strong sunscreen that a lot oh, of like uh, nine uh, SP uh, SP five hundred yes like <laughs> on the nose a lot of time or like right oh through, you're, yeah the black yeah, the bla- yeah. <laughs> walking around like that you know you got it. You got it. but it's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> but like that's that's funny you're you are tessa and you're discovering the mystery and all that stuff i get it i thought that i had to write in third person Mm -hmm. (laughs) because the other books were in third person no No. it depends you know on the the genre the genre yeah yeah the historical fiction has switched to first person so I'm technically not in trend anymore with uh, <laughs> how uh, dare you, Nicole? <laughs> I know <laughs> when I was writing them, it was third person and first person. Yeah. Now That's I'm how they get you. first person. So well, it's but, the same thing with epic yeah. fantasy though. You know, you, you like yeah. some people will be like, Oh, your, uh, your prologue's a little long or your, your chapters. They're like 5,000 to 6,000 words. And you're like, yeah, it's epic high fantasy. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> well, and the, there are trends and there are tropes like the trend or and also expectations like if you have an epic fantasy that's 70,000 words <laughs> that's not epic is it no that's that's the you first need to extend that. yeah <laughs> you need to extend that a little bit right if you put that up as epic fantasy you're going to get one and two stars and you might be just review bombed one stars everywhere that they can possibly go and you're going to be dragged on twitter like yeah this author forgot the whole rest of the book (laughs) yeah they're going to be like what is this mess what is this trash you are lying to me and like there are that whole thing from like long in the beginning of our conversation like where it's not resonating with people okay so then where did you market it to who did you write the book for Idiots. what are your goals <laughs> like you also need to know that stuff yeah. as well it, well it's in i i wrote i wrote my forty thousand word epic fantasy <laughs> uh for impatient people <laughs> go read a novella <laughs> like i'm sure there's a companion novella somewhere on that like counts as a reader magnet. You sign it with someone. Oh my god! Speaking of a companion, like like uh, um, I had someone uh read like uh, one of my outlines, and again, my outlines you could kind of almost read it like a book, but it's not. And they're like, they're like, uh, what is uh this character's like work schedule? <laughs> and I'm like, what? And they're like, I want to know. I was like, first of all, it's a prologue. Yeah, but like you should spend more time with these characters because you know I I don't know who they are. I go in the prologue. The <laughs> thing, <laughs> yeah. What do you mean set up? Like, well, like you should have, you should have, you should break the prologue up into like three chapters. I go then that's not a prologue. Yeah, then it's three chapters that have nothing to do with the actual. The novel has not. The, the prologue is 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 sort of like the outskirt of the story, yeah. and it, you're not supposed to have depth. And like, let's, you know, and I'll, and they go, they go, well, maybe like before the prologue, like have two pages that kind of like explain who everyone is. Like a, like a, what is it, the clue movie or whatever. 
Uh, well, no, they, they were saying like, like summarizes what they're about to experience and, oh. who, and like where, like the histories of characters. I was like, should I release like the histories of before I release the book? And they're like, yeah, I was like, or maybe, and hear me out. <laughs> they could turn the page to chapter one and then eventually get to the end of the book and they will know everything that they need to know for the novel to make sense. You know, it's like people that read, they go, yeah, I was reading a book and I got to the, uh, uh, who's Nicole. And you're like, what do you, what do you mean? I read the first word in the first paragraph on the first page. And <laughs> I was like, why would you mention Nicole? Like, I don't, I'm not emotionally connected to this person yet. I don't know who they are. Like, shouldn't you let me know who they are before? Like, can't you be like, they like, tell me their job, you know? And you're like, that's telling, not showing. Yeah, it's like, this is terrible advice. Well, that's the thing. Like, you know, sometimes you get advice that is the book I would write. And then sometimes you get advice where it's like, why? Well, I don't really understand what the characters are doing. And you're like that. I need to listen to that advice. Not yeah. why, why don't you go into like what their job, like their day job is. And you're like, there are aliens. They're fighting <laughs> aliens. Yeah. They're in the office to start the stuff. We don't need to really know what their job is. We need to know that aliens just arrived. <laughs> yeah. They are in an office setting. So make it up. And yeah. Like, yeah <laughs> you, you, and you're the reader. <laughs> enjoy really yourself. Cool. The big point is the alien invasion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but couldn't we spend some time with like their job? No, no one cares about the mundane. You don't start at the beginning, you start at the middle. You know? Well, they should be reading uh cozies if they want mundane stuff. That's probably <laughs> a reader that it's like you're in the wrong area. <laughs> Jacob <laughs> took the banana from the fruit basket, opened it up from the bottom like the monkeys he had watched on the Discovery Channel. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, they they open it. They they uh, squeeze the bottom. Oh, and then it uh it opens it up quicker. Um, <laughs> the things I know. <laughs> yeah, you watch too many documentaries on nature. Well, I, like the the one th the thing that calms me the most because you know I I live with the uh, chronic depression uh, slash position. The, they call it per persistent depression now. But uh, uh -huh. as like if I'm in silence, I'll I'll just fall apart. So like the way I get around it is I may not read a lot of books. Like I won't read a hundred books like you do, but I'll read and I'll watch and I'll just absorb knowledge because I have a photographic memory. So it like kind of calms me to like fuel that brain element. Yeah. And uh, like uh, my, uh, the person I'm with, she's like going to school to be like a scientist and she's like studying mm -hmm. things and she'll start mentioning something. And they're like, Oh yeah, because blank, 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 blank. But, but, and she's like, how do you know that? It's not, this is like a very niche study. And I was like, oh, well, you know, when I was younger, I had to have either seen it in a book, heard it on television or whatever. Yeah. And it's like, I just know, I just know a lot of, I know a little bit about a lot, but at the same time, yeah. like, I, I think that helps me as a writer because mm -hmm. uh, there's actually, there's, there's a moment in the book where the character's naping a rock and somebody really it was like a really nice note where they were just like, I knew that was a thing, but I didn't know what it was called. And I like and was the process that the character did in the book, how you actually nape a knife. And I was like, yeah, that is uh, that's 100 percent nape. And it was just like it's those little details, you know, mm -hmm. that are important, um, you, you know, and that that goes back to the cultural argument, too. Like you could have any culture you want in a book. But like, understand the purpose of it. Don't just be like, they're a Mexican with a hat. <laughs> like, 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 understand their purpose. And uh, uh, I, I think that helps with immersion as well is there's truth to it, even in fiction. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously, if there's aliens and people flying in space, like science is slightly out the window. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, you, like Transformers from Addis, you know, Transformers, you know, somebody going, well, they where? How did they register the car? Like they're transformers. Like we're not. <laughs> that's not really what we're dealing with today, you know. Like <laughs> or or Terminator, you know, where they yeah. they siphon the gas in the future, and and they're like, well, that gas wouldn't even be useful. They couldn't. And they're like, there's trans. There's Terminators. Like you know, there's. A they student. probably have something in their whatever that makes gas work. Well, no, no. The uh, the soldiers they were siphoning from like old tanks. Oh. 
and, and you know, but at the same time, you're, you know, it's like, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, there's some hiccups where it's like, well, this isn't accurate, but we need to move the story forward. Yeah, um, yeah I think uh, a great book is it's there's a purpose and everything is needed to be in there, and there's realism and believability. Yes. And I think that makes way more sense than like a perfectly crafted written novel that doesn't have all of that or any of that or half of it. Yeah. And, and to your point, uh, it could make sense only to the world that you designed. Like, yeah. like the moment a vampire walks into the scene, your world has established that vampires exist and your world might have different rules Mm -hmm. than where we know vampires are. And as long as it maintains, because that's all, you know, for anyone listening that's right, you know, like you could do whatever you want. It's your imaginative world. But the moment you set something up, you can't not do that. You you know, yeah, yeah. You can't can't be like my vampires don't drink blood. And then like halfway through your book, you know, uh, the vampire is like, I need blood or I'm going to die. And you're just like, Oops, I don't know if that's a vampire anyway. Yeah, there are some things that are there, but then you play around with them. And like I play around with vampires where he get uh Thomas Bloodsworth. Yeah, well you should read it because you can pretend that that's you. Um <laughs> it's on point. That they have or the other world creates magical sunscreen. And it's so freaking expensive because he can walk out in the daylight. Yeah. And he's itchy and he gets a little red, but he's not dead, right? He's not yeah. dead from the being sun. burned alive. And that's I I think also people forget that in Dracula, Dracula walked in daytime. Well, yeah, because he was the so, first though. That's why he was immune to the sun. The the, the 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 uh, vampires made from him are inferior. They they're a yeah. virus, whereas he's the uh, he's patient zero. Uh, yeah. Then, but I there were a lot of people like there has never been a vampire that has walked in the sun. It is not. <laughs> I'm like Dracula. Yeah. Okay, well I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But I'm like, <laughs> what about <okay>? underworld? <laughs> Yeah. Right? In the second <laughs> underworld, she could walk in the sun and the third yeah. one and the fourth one and the six thousand one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, By yeah. the way, if you ever watch Underworld, you gotta watch the eighth movie first, <laughs> then the second one. Yeah. I think you can play with stuff if it makes sense and you do it well. And of course, well is gonna be subjective, but that would be making sense. Like yeah. I've set up well he um pays like fifty thousand dollars for a tube. Of this really powerful sunscreen, so we have stakes here, fifty yeah. thousand dollars <laughs> uh, for Why a is it Made of cow cum. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's magical stuff in there. Right, right, right. Very dangerous. Okay, you gotta have that <laughs> extra, <laughs> you know, on there. But and then it continues on, and it doesn't change. Yeah, you gotta be also consistent. Yeah consistent with your world building but um with that one it was i'm basically just taking what i used to believe as a neo-pagan and just slapping the urban fantasy (laughs) and then it's easy i don't have to really make stuff up yeah i already know it and that's what a lot of wiccans and neo-pagans are if you know some you know have a conversation it's gonna differ um But overall, it's pretty solid of what Wiccans and Neo-Pagans believe. Yeah. And I guess that would be low fantasy. For them, it's not. It's real life. <laughs> yeah, they're like, no, Kyle, it's low it. fantasy. Yeah. David Where Copperfield is real. <laughs> yeah. I did not create a whole new anything I just pulled from. I, I actually want to ask you a question based on what you're saying. Um mm-hmm. The uh, the idea that uh, you can create anything and you play with it and you have rules. Have you ever come up with an idea that was really um, a very like I'll give an arbitrary example and then you could place that onto anything you could remember. Mm-hmm. 
So like if I create a vampire that uh, survives off of uh, instead of blood, they siphon off like living energy. Right. And that's how they live. And then people are like, that's not how vampires go. Have you ever had a situation where you created something that was not, quote unquote, the norm of what we might see? And there was just a lot of pressure on everyone around you going, you got, you can't do that. You have to change it. But you're like, I really believe in this direction. And then you were like, <clears throat> and then you just did whatever you wanted. Does that make sense? Or was that completely? No, I haven't had that pushback ever. Could be that uh, not enough people reading my books. Which <laughs> <laughs> we have right? um, well, you don't have beta readers? Oh, yeah. No, I, I had in the past. Um, now you're like, forget they didn't that. push back on stuff. Yeah, I write pretty clean. Um, <laughs> the only thing that was not clean was the one time with the two foxes that my editor says, um, rewrite the second half because it doesn't make sense. I'm like, okay, did they ask no. you what the fox says? <laughs> I will throw. <laughs> Not my worst enemy, the stale bread. Well, it's aggressive, but not really because it's yeah. soft. I try not to be too aggressive because I do uh, yeah. tend to freak people out sometimes. <laughs> aggressive. Trust me, that was pretty <laughs> freaky, but I like it. You know, um, even I think also it's a like like we were talking about it has to make sense and they're consistent whatever and then it's about uh being confident in your choices like yes my vampire wears sunscreen yeah what are you gonna do about it <laughs> not read <laughs> okay <laughs> you don't need to read you don't need to continue yeah. if you want like the classic vampire this is not for you but i think it's hilarious so <laughs> we're gonna continue <laughs> <laughs> go into the sun yes and he wears like you know a long trench coat and like a little uh fedora you just gotta keep it keep it. as i would because i'm the character yes. <laughs> and but he's also like a punk rocker okay. and he wears you know band t-shirts that you might not know about like tiger army love yeah army, right and it's just fun Mm -hmm. But it has to make sense. And then if someone doesn't like it, well, you're going to, you have to be happy with your decision. Like I'm extremely happy with the world because it's not, I didn't even technically create, I created some stuff like, you know, vampires, sunscreen. <laughs> uh, the sunscreen on the vampire created, but the world that I built for the urban fantasy, it's there. I yeah. love it. I um, have very fond memories of growing up in that world, um, thinking that fairies were real and, you know, I might happen upon one in a forest. Like, it's whimsical. Well, fairies wear boots and you got to believe me, you know. Well, uh, and also, you know, if you go uh, to Ireland, they're like, yeah, we put out milk <laughs> just in case because you don't piss off the fairies. Especially after you have a baby. Yeah. You don't want to piss. Don't piss them off. Don't piss yeah, you don't want like, them to steal your child. Yeah. And that whole line, don't piss off the fairies, is a huge thing in uh, neo, like in the neo-pagan and Wiccan sphere where like they have yeah. artwork <laughs> that says don't piss off the fairies. And you put them like in the doorway or like in the hallway and you said, don't, don't do it because your keys are going to be lost. And yeah. then i don't know like you're stuck here <laughs> the, only, the only fairy i ever had to worry about is my mom's friend anyway uh so <laughs> <laughs> uh i i want to uh, so um ha because you've read a lot of books right have mm -hmm. have you ever read a book where you were just like this is the best like you were just so you were like i can't wait to finish this book because it's so good but then like you get to a point where something is so stupid Mm -hmm. that you are just like, I refuse to finish this book because that is so stupid. 
<laughs> that the entire experience that I was having has been tainted by the stupidity that is placed here. Have you ever had that experience? Uh, I don't know. I will start out with, so I start out five stars. Yeah. Um, automatically. Very optimistic. Yeah. You're like, uh, And then it just goes <laughs> down from there. But I've started out where it's like five stars and then five pages in, I'm like, what's this? <laughs> that, was, um, that was that was Never Night by Jay Kristoff. Oh yeah, oh yeah, they still owe me money. Uh- <laughs> um, that was that was an interesting. Experience. So you didn't even finish that book. You were just like, nope. I, no, I finished it to say it's bad. <laughs> But I have that was in like 2017. I've info dumped that yeah. book because um, I've I've now replaced it with better books that we can talk about, right? <laughs> um, but and that's the that's the weird prose where it's very purpley, and some yeah. people love that, and that is not for me. But you know, subjective. They love exactly. that thing. I'm like, oh yeah, no, that did that whole sentence didn't make sense what were you trying to say and then like the people that love her like okay well the symbolism <laughs> this so I'm like Ripley. oh right i don't think that it is but subjective art okay moving on i gotta read another book <laughs> <laughs> we're just moving on <laughs> okay, now uh do you, ha- do you have a uh, a guilty pleasure book that like would objectively be considered not a good book like people are just like no, no one like likes it around you, and you're like, but this book is like, I love this book. I love reading this book, but like, no one else likes it. No, because you there's know? so many people like Sarah J. Mass. <laughs> there's a whole of so now you see the dandy um, fox right oh, there. Oh yeah, I see the dandy. That's all Sarah J. Mass. <laughs> really, that whole that whole that role whole shelf right there. Nice. Um, so. And I've I have said many times the writing's not great, but she makes me cry every single book. Yeah, people say my book makes them cry because they have to read it. Well, then I think you might need some uh, editor, <laughs> oh, <son> uh, <laughs> new beta reader. I mean, the stories that you have said about these beta readers, maybe you need another. Yeah, right. Well, the worst Maybe is they're when... not helping. No, they're not helping. Uh, the, the worst is when they give you line edits and you're like, you're you're an alpha reader like copy and line editing very end of the process you line yeah. edit then you get a copy edit. i still have many drafts <laughs> i'm not gonna focus on editing the grammar <laughs> well, there it. are some people that have that ask beta readers to do all of it and then like they think that maybe that will help save money oh, no. I don't know that might no, no. Not do that because the editors are not charging per typo or whatever they're charging for the per word yeah yeah do you hire do you do you outsource your editing so you don't have to focus on it or do you take care of it yeah uh my editor sarah corn she does well she's also a self-published writer but she uh edits for grimdark magazine and then a bunch of other trad and indie writers and yeah, Murder's Fairies is with her, and she's like, I'm so excited. I'm like, thank you. She's like, I just want to, I just want a fun read. I want a, I want a good read. And I know that's from you. I'm like, oh, thank you. Don't say that though, because you might uh, jinx it. And I have my dear. I can have. Don't, don't, don't mess with the fairies. Don't, don't, yeah, don't, don't do it. Don't do it. But, um, yeah. Has she ever given you a line edit uh, uh, critique and you just like, no, I'm going to keep it how it is. Yeah, like twice. Yeah. And that's more like a, a one of them was just a, it's like a it's like a pagan store thing. Yeah. Right? It's kind of normal the setup of like a pagan store, which if you don't know what that is. No pun intended. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't know what it is, then, uh, well, it's just where all pagans go to buy stuff. Like Walmart. You got, yeah. You got, <laughs> them, you got your gods and goddesses statues. Yeah. Um, some jewelry. Mm-hmm. The local, yeah, like, the local just, crematorium. Yeah. It's just, uh, what an, what a pagan would need. Right. Yeah, yeah. 
And so it's just, that was a uh, kind of a thing where I was like, yeah, that's kind of just there. Like, I'm just going to ignore that one. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, um, not really all that. Like I might, yeah, she's told me I write really clean. So I, over and over again, she has told me this. So I'm, I'm just saying what she's telling me. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're not, you're not, uh, uh, Oh, <laughs> one second. Uh. Oh, I'm going to go to the bathroom. Oh, you're going to go. All right. One, one second. One second. I'll look. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so, uh, we, we know that you were talking and then you were just like, uh, you had, your bladder was like, we got to go. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, but with that, uh, <laughs> I, by the way, uh, we're, we went, we went over an hour and I just want you to know that's, that's always a good sign. Cause, uh, yeah. if the interview is going well, I just let it kind of go. I don't, I don't stop yeah. it. But, uh, time wise, I know, I know we have vampire, uh, uh, sun lotion we have to go buy. So, yes. um, and reapply. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We got to reapply. Uh, my beard helps me a little bit, but, uh, that's besides yeah. point. Um, but I, I, you know, obviously I ask a question all the time to all my uh, um, guests. However, the question I usually ask, uh, you've already answered the uh, what is one piece of advice you discovered about writing uh, mm -hmm. that changed the way you approach writing. So I'm going to ask you the other question that I really like to ask people. And that is, if you could go back to the first day you started your writing journey, what advice would you give your younger self? I don't remember that first day. Um, <laughs> well, basically, what do you know now that you wish uh -huh. you knew then? You know? uh, grammar and punctuation. <laughs> Period. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I could have uh, skipped a few years, uh, or I definitely did not need to have to take that basic uh, English class that was like, you know, Twenty five hundred dollars. Yeah. I could have saved twenty five hundred dollars if I knew the grammar and punctuation <laughs> <laughs> that that was not taught to me. So um, the teachers back in elementary school, and middle school, and high school teach me as you're supposed to. <laughs> yeah, right. Give me those m dashes. Like, where do they go? <laughs> What's an adverb? <laughs> just just give me a basic one sentence, half a sentence. I don't half know. Do you know? Do you know what an adverb is now? Uh, isn't it? It's uh, at the end where it's ly, or is that adjective? Well, uh, well, a verb is action. Action, and an adverb describes the action. Right? You know, he ran fast. Fast would be the oh. adverb. Interesting. Um, <laughs> I know adverb. a noun, which is a person, place, or thing. That's right. That's right. It okay. is. A Oh, no, adjectives are the ones with the L-I and people like, don't do adjectives, which I do sometimes. So. Yeah, but, uh, there, but there are like, um, yeah, but an adjective can describe something as well. Like, it could, but, uh, but at the same time, there are a uh, lack shockingly. of. Yeah, yeah it's, like, it's like the L-Y, don't do the adverbs or like yeah. it. that's telling, not showing. So then it would be show them shocked instead of say oh my god he said yeah, shock yeah. yeah well you know it, the the real secret to show sometimes tell is that you still have to tell occasionally for context mm -hmm. but yeah. showing should be uh the primary immersion uh which also means you can use ly words just you know sparingly like yeah, like i just did uh, uh <laughs> but like when you read a book where it's all showing you're like there's no yeah. there's no context yeah you got it. I've, I've dropped a few LYs and then it's like at this point showing everything is not good. We need to move on. Yeah. Like for like action scenes, do you need to or do you need me to have like a bunch of other sentences, maybe even a paragraph? Or do you want to get to the action of where, you know, she's gutting someone? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You know, like oh, right? there's, <laughs> we're like, getting to get to that point. Like the I point is the more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, the rule I go by is uh, show the narrative movement, tell the skip, you know, like mm -hmm. I don't need to show them going through the door. I could just yeah. be like, they left, you know, 
or mm -hmm. you know she watched she watched him leave the room in a fuss like that's all you need because it's not narratively important we need yeah. to stay in the movement of of the narrative and and that's what you show and that's why you're allowed to tell sometimes i think it's it's mm -hmm. it's almost uh uh what do you call it i think i think it takes away from the story when you don't use tell um but the same you know you and i we're this we say we're the same where it's like you know no fluff but some people are like well i need some purple in there and it's like yes but use it sparingly like six paragraphs in a row of purple is not as impactful as like getting to the point through the immersion of action or or movement you know and uh but you also said it too if you're in a sword fight you don't have to explain how she she drew the sword and the shink uh, emerged from the sheath of the blade as it raised to the air in a backward swing leading into a lunge. Like, you don't have to do that. You just like she drew a sword and ran. But like the interesting part would be the how did the sword enter the person? How you know, what is the blood like? You know, that's the interesting part, not <laughs> The shink of the blade emerged <laughs> from the shit, the sheath, and you know, like, like half that. Just do like, or whatever you said about the taking out of the um, sheath and then the clinking, but then don't do the other stuff. And yeah. then she's running forward, and okay, we hit, and now we're fighting. You yeah. could you just. Sprinkle, okay, sprinkles on the ice cream. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you put you yeah, to, little things. Yeah, you have to, I think you have to write a lot and read a lot and just experience, you know, as much as you can um, and just do trial and error and figure out what you, how or how you work and then writing gets a little easier. <laughs> um, <laughs> I still struggle and like how many books do I have? Minus the chat books, which are four. Um, three standalones, two books, and then like I'm starting Midnight Murders. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, but you also have your poetry prose books, right? Yeah, I mean those are kind of poetry's a little different. <laughs> those are throwaways <laughs> that I do on a Sunday. <sighs> yeah, it's a little angsty. <laughs> but yeah, it took. I think, well, I just think it's fascinating. I think also my editor said like, you're, you're uh, decreasing in uh word count, but it's still great. It yeah. doesn't, you know, it's, I'm not telling you to add stuff. Like it's a complete story. You don't add stuff to it. Um, and that's just how I've gotten over the years, like really yeah. need it. Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't love the whole thing. Like, I love all that I need. Quote that. <laughs> I love all that I need. I like it. Uh, well, yeah, but you're also not uh, discouraged to read a book just because it is a high fantasy or epic fantasy. Because as long as it moves, even in its length, that would be a good read. It's the slow reads that you don't really, the dense reads that kind of push you off, right? Well, I haven't. When was my last high fantasy? Well, the, you're reading Tolkien. Oh, does that count as high fantasy? But like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's literally epic high fantasy. That is that is the Godfather of why it even exists. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm thinking epic fantasy is like 800 pages for one book. Yeah, but how big is Return of the King? You know, how big is Fellowship? My yeah. copy, like 400. 50. Oh yeah, but you, yours is uh it's not the six by nine. I mean uh it's a six by no, nine, like right? It's the market. It's uh it's a box set that a friend sent me. I'm so like the size, the size of the book. It's a six by nine. Oh no, it's the like a kind of it's a pocket. Oh, it's a pocket size. It's four hundred. Well, that's still a lot of work. That's okay. four hundred times uh five hundred. The font is small. Yeah, I'm sure. So, <laughs> I'm sure it is. But like. When I'm looking at that's two thousand, you know, two hundred thousand words easily. Is it really? Okay. Five hundred words. Yeah, it's five hundred words. See, this is the word count thing. We don't know. <laughs> For all we know, it's actually sixty-two thousand words. Now, <laughs> well, let me, let me but, see. Let me see. I have the answer right here. Let's but, see. But when I, I look at page count, not word count, I think most people do. 
page count and the return of the king's like 450 which is fine for me but then like the last epic fantasy like big one was like 800 pages and i Boy. could not do it was that a brandon sanderson no it was uh evan winters Oh, Evan. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, oh god, it's too much. It's Do you read much. Jordan Roberts? No. The t- the, that uh, real time. Yeah. Okay. I had a conversation. <laughs> I had a conversation about that with my reading uh, group. Yeah. And they were like, <laughs> because I don't like when you set up a female character and it's all like the growth is just about trauma and revenge. And they were like, well, then maybe you shouldn't read that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want female trauma? Come on. I'm like, do we really have to have all these assaults and that makes her strong? I think you can do more. That was also a thing with um, the Outlander series by Di- Diana. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, everyone in that media f- immediate family has some type of um, SA. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm just like, I don't know if that's possible. I've done multiple times. Well, both the lead the characters argument, definitely do. Yeah, no, the and the argument from Outlander fans, and I used to be a huge fan in those Facebook groups. Okay, I know all this, right? When you were no, young, no, Nicole? It used to be, well, it's historically accurate. <laughs> you know what? I don't think so. It still <laughs> makes me terrible. That... The Frazier family oh, yeah. has so like they keep getting assaulted, yeah, over and over and over again. All of them, even the adoptive son. Are we real? That's his story. Stop it. He de- he definitely was. Yeah, when he joined the in the uh, right the native uh, right then he get- no, no, that's another one. The the French and when they were in. Brand. Oh, oh! I know he, the guy who he lost was, his uh, leg or arm or something, right? Yeah, his hand. He lost his hand. That no, guy. I'm saying uh, that's the French S-A. kid. No, S A. I'm not trying to get you like into trouble. Oh yeah, yeah, but I the French doesn't the French guy have an S A moment? Yes, a guy's yeah, yeah, a kid. Yeah. yeah. Even him, Frasers, all, all, all of them S A. <laughs> I'll tell you, man. When 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 Fraser gets captive. And they're like, I'll let the girl go if you let me do this to you. And I was just like, yeah. what is going on here? Like, I would have killed this. <laughs> There's no way I wouldn't have just choked the hell out of him. Right. And then people were like, oh, yeah, my. but he would kill you. I go, I would rather die. Yeah. I. That's a thing. Like, that's not even a, we, that's a discussion from like, um, that I had when I was doing self-defense classes, different conversation of like, that it's really, um, it's heavy where it's like, are you going to fight and die? Or are you going yeah. to, you know, there is a choice here and you should think about it. I'm like, I will fight and I will die. It's not happening. Yeah, That's no my way. personal choice. There were other people in that self-defense class that were like, I can't kill someone. I'm like, I get it. Okay. I'm going, if you're, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're it's on. Sorry. Like that's a personal choice. If and, I don't um, kill you, and, I will yeah. find you and kill you when it's over. <laughs> well, and then the whole thing of like, okay, if I am outmatched, then I will do every single thing in my power to get the DNA under my nails. Uh-huh. Like I will just do this until I'm dead and I'm going to then haunt you. Yeah. That's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> Oh, so more. Really, I like it. Oh God! Yeah. <laughs> but, but like, as I'm reading the Outlander things, I'm like, this is too much. That I guess that's also the same thing for Wheel of Time. And I think I see, though, that's also Game of Thrones. So there are things where I'm just like, is this, um, like an a weird thing with epic fantasy and the S A? Well. Outlander is like time travel, historical romance, time. I don't even know. Like, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Like, five different genres. It's amazing at this point. It's so freaking popular. Because yeah, it's, it's definitely historical fiction. 
yeah, and it's time travel, and you get a little sci-fi because of yeah. they include science in the later book, whatever. Would you almost consider a portal as well? Oh no, because she doesn't technically go through a portal; she just touches the stone. Yeah, yeah, and then like there's the science of like ge- the genetics of how they can time travel, and I'm like, this is a lot. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that's one of the outliers where you're surprised that it's it was first like traditionally published and then got really popular because it's so much within one story and it, it's like what eight or nine books in and like they're chunky like yeah. the last few books are 800 plus pages why did i keep reading um because i'm deep in it yeah it's like true I'm blood already there <laughs> Like, we need to figure out how it, this ends because I have spent so much time, okay? Yeah. <laughs> but then now with, like, the epic fantasy, um, 800 pages going in, and there's, like, six books, and they're all 800, and some of them are 1,000. I'm like, <laughs> you can't do it. I'm doing it with Outlander. I can't do this. <laughs> like, so I don't actually read that much uh, epic fantasy minus Tolkien. Because Tolkien's like smaller. I guess it is a lot of words, yeah. but they made it compact. It's not as well. It moves. Yeah, it moves. Like the fellowship is like almost 190,000 words. My my first book in the series is 250,000 words. And then the second one's about the same. But then mm-hmm. the third one gets a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. They get a little thicker as it goes. But mm-hmm. the way I write the cinematic comment that i get is because it moves as it needs and it doesn't linger but it doesn't the pacing is still there so like emotional moments we link we have a moment we breathe on but like you know i I don't i think that's what makes high fantasy a little chunky for me is when they i don't do exposition i hate exposition i do character exposition where like characters are living through the truth or Mm -hmm. things are being explored because they're part of the experience but I'll never stop and have someone go anyway. So uh, <laughs> giants, let me tell you about giants, eh, <laughs> right? I don't do that, yeah. Yeah. but I will show a giant and mm-hmm. they will be doing things. Yeah. Not the giants are in my story, but as, a, as an example, and you would get this, like I, I have trolls and the, one of the big compliments I get is I said more with the first appearance of a troll than most writers do with an entire series. And all I did was they had a language and they had Mm -hmm. tattoos and they were automatically like, do they have a society? Are they intelligent? What's it like? Like, do they have community? And I was like, I am not going to, you got to read the book. You got to read, finish me. But it's (laughs) those moments that becomes the exposition is we see them, we hear them, we experience them. And that's my favorite form of exposition is when we learn through the experiences of the characters and less about stopping going, did you know that trolls, you know, like, yeah. like it yeah. kills me. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I apologize. The rant about trolls. Yeah. I have, oh no, sorry. I don't have trolls. I have um, ogres in the obsidian murders. The ogres, the ogres. Well, you, you probably have normal vampire. I have, I have what's called lyricists. They're they're uh, light vampires. They because I have two sons in my world, so a lot of things uh, are associated with the, the double sons, and they, they actually they absorb sunlight. They still need blood, but the sun makes yeah. them actually powerful, and at night they become weaker. So I almost play uh, with the uh, yeah. the idea of vampires. Um, but anyway, listen, we are at <laughs> an hour and forty minutes. It's six ten. <laughs> uh, I love talking to you, so I, I we could do this all day, honestly. Yeah, we'll just keep getting more episodes in, you know. Yeah, yeah. You gotta catch up to Jonathan. You know? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh Nicole, even though the information will be in the description below, why don't you tell the listeners of the audio version how they mm-hmm. find you? Well I am mainly on Facebook, Goodreads and YouTube. YouTube is Nicole's bookish nook and if you Google me, you can just put in Nicole Pierman 
I don't know about Nicole Brona yet. The Nicole Brona is just the urban fantasy series that's brand new, so it might not pop up in your searches. But <laughs> I, uh, I've linked on Amazon uh, the urban fantasy with my given name. So even if you type in Nicole Pierman, you don't remember like anything about the urban fantasy, it'll pop up. <laughs> pop up i'll pop up everywhere because i'm annoying like that <laughs> i did a great seo just situation you know so i got you i got you just don't mess with the fairies no no <laughs> don't pick up the fairies they'll probably mess up the seo and then um <laughs> pee in your milk uh, you know. <laughs> well pee is good especially if you're trying to wash your hands um <laughs> uh so with that thank you again uh nicole for being on the show uh, absolutely a pleasure as always. Thank you. All right. As always, keep developing your right mindset. I'll see you next time, people. Bye. Bye.